Another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your fear, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. Welcome back to segment two of Granite Grok's Grok Talk here in uh, beautiful Concord, New Hampshire, where it's nice and chilly. It's cold outside. Uh, it's 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on January 10th, 2015. We'd like to thank Darlene Pollock from New Hampshire Right to Life for coming in and filling us in on uh, some of the things going on in uh, New Hampshire uh, on the issue of life. And uh, we'd like to remind you that Kevin Kerbick will be joining us in the next segment to talk about recent statements by the SNHU president about social justice. For now, we would like to welcome to the program Jason Sorens. Uh, Dr. Sorens is a lecturer in the government department at Dartmouth College and received his PhD in political science. Silence. Political silence. <laughs> There's a political science at Yale. There is a nice Freudian nice nice slip for me. Thank you so much for saying that. Uh, he's got a new uh, program that he's working on that we want to start with. I know people are going to want to talk about the Free State Project, but uh, uh, we met him uh, a few weeks back, and he brought this up, and we, we want to get it some uh, some attention. Uh, it's called Ethics and Economics and Education of New England. Uh, Dr. Sorens, welcome to the program. Good morning, uh, Stephen Skip. Thanks for having me on. Sure. Great to have you here. So you've got this E3NE thing going on here. Why don't you tell our listeners what this is all about? Yeah, so Ethics and Economics Education of New England, we are going into high schools um, starting in just a couple of weeks and running a program educating them in moral philosophy and economic principles. Uh, So we'll be bringing in great thinkers in political thought like John Locke and John Stuart Mill, people who really defend um, liberty and individual rights. And we are also bringing in um, economic principles, so Henry Hazlitt, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, people like that who've um, really expressed in a, in a deep but accessible way um, uh, very important economic ideas about how markets work, how prices work, you know, why, uh, why profits are, are good in the economy, things like that. And our view is that economic education is really important for citizenship. If you don't understand economic principles, then you're not going to understand how to hold politicians accountable for, uh, for their economic policies. But in addition, economics requires a moral background. If you're uh, if you've just got economics uh, and without the moral background, you might be tempted to, um, you know, to just think that well, economic uh, pragmatism is the only uh, is the only criteria for evaluating things, and and uh, and we think that that's mistaken. That um, we need to understand uh, the background of, uh, of human dignity, of, of individual rights, uh, natural rights, um, that sort of circumscribe where economics has its domain. Okay, so th- you've been teaching at the university level for, what, about 12 years, I think you said? Um, That's right. And uh, as you've developed this program, you're going to be taking it into high schools. Um, I, I've since read all these authors that you're talking about, but I never had any clue who they were when I was in high school, so I, I came to this, this brilliant thought much later in my life. Um, how, how successful do you think you've been at um, adapting this material for that audience? I, I think we've been very successful. I, um, I have been teaching at the college level, so this is uh, a new thing for me, bringing it to the high school level. I participate in a program like this in high school, so I know it can work. This is an age when students are open to new ideas. They're starting to, to be open to society around them. They're starting to want to figure out politics and economics and, and uh, social forces. And this is a way to make that world make sense to them. And so it's going to be very um, unclass-like. We're going to try to appeal to the students by making it as different as possible from a typical classroom experience. So it's not going to be lecture. It's going to be discussion-based, 
they will get free books, um, sort of classic works in the in the field. Um, I'll come in with questions uh, that will provoke them, like, um, you know, have you ever heard people say that um, oh, we're too concerned about um, about rights and not our duties? And you know, that's a common thing that people say. And then we'll try to figure out. Well, does that make sense? And it turns out that the only way to understand rights is that rights are duties. Uh, so there's really no distinction between rights and duties. Uh, we'll talk about uh, things like, um, you know, have you ever heard people say that um, to boost the local economy, you should, you should buy local? And we'll talk about the problems with that, and, uh, and that's a way of sort of introducing comparative advantage. Uh, so, you know, these are things that are, that are sort of hot topics. They're... The things that will uh, uh, appeal to them, they'll they'll see that the people are talking about these things and that they want to make sense of them. So, uh, at a very kind of introductory level, we'll um, we'll show what the the fallacies are with uh, kind of make work um, economics, like right? the idea that well, let's just give people jobs and, and jobs is the appropriate focus of economics. Let's uh, you know, let's let's try to focus on boosting demand. You know, those those sorts of um, economic uh, fallacies are sort of um, sort of popular. The the idea that we can just increase spending and that's that's what's going to create economic growth in the long run. Well, no economist believes that. Not even not even traditional Keynesians believe that increasing spending and increasing demand is the way to long run uh, economic growth. So um, we'll show them that it's all about exchange. It's all about uh, productivity, being able to make more, um, developing technology, uh, developing exchange over a broader uh, number of people. That's where economic growth comes from. Uh, and another incentive for students to participate is that at the end of the year, they get to participate in a speech competition where they can win college scholarships. So we're, we're touting four main advantages of this program to high school students. Um, first, relaxed discussions with a Dartmouth professor, and a lot of them are interested in applying to Dartmouth or other uh, selective schools, and this is a way of kind of having a little bit of that access to, uh, to the faculty that they'll, um, that they'll have in the future. Um, they also get free books, they get a chance to practice their public speaking skills, and they can win some scholarship money. Uh, so uh, I'm excited about it. Dr. Sarnes, uh, this is Skip, and I want to say thank you for coming on the show. It was good to meet you as well uh, a couple of weeks ago, finally. Um, I want to tag into the first word of, of this, the ethics part. And even though I knew that you were coming on the show, I didn't realize when I read this following title from Instapundit of a post that I knew you were coming on the show. As many as 64 Dartmouth College students, including some athletes, could face suspension or other disciplinary measures for cheating in an ethics class this past fall. Glenn adds in, I love that it was an ethics class. Yeah. And, you know, what you were describing about teaching the high school kids, you know, I could blithely pass off and say, well, how about some of the folks at your own uh, university as well? And a little bit tongue-in-cheek. But... You know, our founding fathers said that, uh, you know, our form of government is only for a virtuous people. And I think you're right in stating that economics just can't be about, you know, government spending, creating jobs and all that. There is the ethical standpoint that seems to be uh, disappearing here in American life. From my standpoint, the further and further we go to being merely a secular society, that a lot of people who used to receive at least some ethics or some moral background from strong families, from uh, church, and I hate, I know a lot of liberals will get upset at that, or secularists, and maybe we'll hear from the um, militant atheists on this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we like to annoy people. Um, but without a grounding of, of absolute morals and ethics, how long will our economic system last? I mean, you have to be able to trust people, but if you don't feel that you have to return that trust, what happens? One of the key points which government is actually supposed to do, this is Mike, uh, Jason, uh, which is to preserve the rule of law, to enable uh, contracts and the enforcement of contracts 
without which the capitalist system simply cannot function. Sorry, back to you, Doctor. Yeah, I, I, capitalism depends on uh, on a basis of, of virtues, um, honesty and integrity, probity, um, you know, willingness to trust others who are trustworthy. Um, so there, if, if you don't have those basics, then most of, of what goes on in business can't happen. I mean, most of what goes on, on in business is on a handshake basis. It's not based on contracts being enforced in the courts. Once, once that falls apart, once you are relying on the court system to enforce everything, every agreement, every deal in, in business, the costs explode, and you really can't have a, a working economy. Um, but beyond that, I mean, if, if people don't have a strong sense of, of human dignity, of the value of every person, and of the strong uh, moral objective, moral obligations that um, are... That, that sort of attend upon that, um, then, they're, then they're not going to respect freedom in the long run. And, and if you're, you can't be a moral relativist and someone who respects freedom, because if you're a moral relativist, then, well, what's what's wrong with uh, with North Korea or uh, you know or or with the um, Islamist uh, terrorists? Um, so they they kill people. Well, that's their value. Their value is to kill people. So we can't judge that. Right? <laughs> one of the so that, uh, that's a real big problem. One of the questions you have in the uh, handout that we got from you is what moral obligations do businesses have? So what moral obligations do businesses have? Yeah, I, I think, and again, this is not going to be me dictating to the students. It's more about a conversation, bringing mm-hmm. up, bringing up things. You know, sure. What about this? What about that? But my view is that businesses have an obligation to be honest. Um, with their customers to not deceive them or mislead them, even by omission. Um, I, I think that it's fine for a business to be solely focused on profit, so long as it's also respecting customers' rights and not trying to deceive them. Um, I also think it's fine for a business to have objectives other than profit, obviously, because uh, you know, I started a couple of nonprofits. So... I don't think that businesses necessarily have an obligation to um, to their so-called stakeholders, right? That uh, businesses, even beyond uh, maximizing profits and respecting people's rights, have to try to um, meddle in their employees' welfare or in the welfare of the cities in which they operate. And there is a there is a kind of progressive theory out there of business business ethics that uh, businesses have an obligation to sort of maximize stakeholder value and not just shareholder value, but it's really unclear who is a stakeholder. Anyone affected by a business potentially is a stakeholder. And then once you do that, as, as Milton Friedman noted, you don't get the, the social benefits of capitalism anymore because the social benefits of capitalism depend on businesses trying to maximize profit and thereby sending signals to the marketplace about what's needed. If the profit's high in an industry, that's a signal that, hey, make more of this. You know, additional firms, enter this industry. If we don't have those signals anymore, if businesses are pursuing some sort of muddled cloud of, of um, uh, sort of objectives, uh, then I think we put at risk uh, some of the virtues of the free enterprise system. All right, Dr. Sorens, we're going to take a quick 60-second break. We'll be right back. Stay on the line. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. I really can't say. Baby, it's cold outside. We're going to keep playing yeah. this because it's cold out. 
outside. Is it cold? And, in, is it cold in Lebanon, New Hampshire, this morning? It is. Yes, probably a little colder than in Concord. Probably a little bit. Now, Skip, you said you had. It was minus nineteen in Guilford uh, yesterday, day before. Yeah. When I first got up in the morning, it, my hydrogen, as I said earlier in the show, my hydrogen peroxide in my car's first aid kit froze solid. <laughs> That's cold. All right, so uh, we are on the phone with Dr. Jason Sorens, who is uh, a lecturer in government at Dartmouth College. We've been talking about uh, E3NE, but I'm pretty sure some of our listeners are going to want to talk about the Free State Project a little bit, so maybe we can kind of uh, go ahead, Skip. You had a question. Actually, and I think uh, Dr. Sorens started to bring this up on his own, where you started to talk about the social responsibility that seems to be put upon uh, corporations. And you mentioned it was a progressive idea and the idea of stakeholders versus shareholders and the muddiness that's coming about because I think that it is another step of the democratization effort to control corporations and not democratization that anybody can participate and have a vote. Well, actually, that's what progressives want. If you notice, they want corporations to be controlled by the people, not by the owners, but by the people, which leads us more into a socialized state. The, the right. Free State Project, which I would have to say, even though all of us are pretty much transplants here to New Hampshire, we're here more for the because of the live fry, live fry. Oh, gosh. No, I do eat not work. Eat fries or die. <laughs> I do not work die. for Burger King or, or McDonald's. The live free or die. Uh, oh, gosh. The live free or die ethic. And we see that in the Free State Project where people just want to come here to be free, to live their lives and to sort of be part of the unspoken, just leave us alone coalition. And we're very much in, in, in favor of the Free State Project, but we see a lot of the folks, and you probably know the infamous statement by New Hampshire State Representative Cynthia Chase of, well, we have to take away freedom so that they won't come here. Um, mm -hmm. Isn't this part and parcel and wrapped up into part of this program? Because we see the impetus for government to take over more and more. And I think when I read through the materials, this is more of let's make this an individual. What are you going to do in the face of this? Giving people the information to be able to say, I have to be taking it uh, involved in this personally I have to understand what my values are versus let's vote right yeah that's that's right it's about taking personal responsibility for uh, for one's own thoughts and actions and justifications and I, I think education plays a big role in that and it's what I mean by education there is uh, not not some sort of rote learning or indoctrination, but um, a willingness to, to question and take a skeptical disposition to, to arguments and actually think things through. And so that's, that's what I'm, I'm doing with E3 and E, is, is uh, trying to influence that next generation and get them to actually take a skeptical eye to some of these things that sound good, because socialism sounds good on paper. It sounds like, well, this is the unselfish way to do things. Um, but in practice, of course, socialism ends up being the most selfish system and ends up be those with the political power um, determine how things go. And if you, you know, want access to resources, you need to have pull with the, the guys at the center. So that's the exact opposite of, a, of an unselfish system. Uh, but people don't realize that to, uh, to start off with. Yeah, uh, I often, when I write on Granite Rock, I talk about the pillars of our capitalistic society and the pillars of our republic and oftentimes the two are the same the one of which is the rule of law not only in our personal lives do we depend upon that so that we are not held hostage by a capricious government which I start to wonder about because there are too many laws to have the rule of law but it also affects corporations and we see when government uh, makes those go haywire I go think back to the, the takeover of GM and Chrysler back in the early part of Obama's um, presidency when they quote unquote try to save them and the other pillar being the right to private property which in that case they t completely trash the senior bondholders 
who should have had first go at the remains of a bankrupt GM, and we see the whittling away of that right to private property. Tell me, in this class that you do, uh, do you talk about those two? Are they emphasized or em uh, just merely in, in uh, passing are they mentioned? Because I think they're extremely important, but from your standpoint, uh, where do they play a role in, in this class for high schoolers? Yeah, private property rights are key, and they're a big part of this program. Uh, there's both a pragmatic case for property rights, which is that uh, you're going to take care of something. You're going to try to uh, make sure it has good long-run value if you own it. Uh, if you don't own it, if ownership is unclear, if everybody owns it, then no one has an incentive to take care of it. And that's what we see often with, um, with public lands uh, when access isn't controlled properly. They, they degrade very quickly. Um, but private farms become very, very productive because if you own that property and the, uh, and the sort of the fruit of it, then you're going to try to, to take care of it. Um, but there's also a moral case for private property, and um, that comes out of a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the philosophers of the Enlightenment, including uh, including Adam Smith, uh, whose theory of moral sentiments, I think, is often overlooked in favor of the wealth of nations. Uh, but Adam Smith makes some key points about uh, contrasting justice and beneficence. And he says, you know, if, um, if something is a duty of justice, if you have a duty of justice to someone, then what an impartial spectator feels when, when observing a breach of that duty is a kind of resentment, right? If you kill somebody, if you take their stuff, if you defraud somebody, and we observe that, we think, hey, you don't deserve that. Those advantages are unjust. Those advantages that you took, we need to take them back from you. So we feel a kind of resentment against you. If you fail in your duty of beneficence, and right, if you fail to be beneficent to someone, we don't feel resentment towards you. Right? What would we think about someone who said, oh, you didn't give me a Christmas present this year. I resent you. you know, I'm going, I am going to take what's mine from you. <laughs> you're, you're a sociopath. Right? That's crazy. Um, but at the same time, being beneficent is still a duty. It's, there's, there's an important moral value to being beneficent, being benevolent to people. Um, but it's not a duty of justice. It's a duty that we can only undertake when we have private property, when we have things that, uh, that we have control over and, and we can out of the, the goodness of our heart, um, transfer rights to those things to uh, the people in need. And so when we do that, we're actually exercising virtue. We're not exercising virtue if everything is socialized and we're just, uh, you know, and, and, and people can take what they want. There's no, there's no virtue there. There's no virtue in being forced to be uh, benevolent if it's not your choice. Um, so one of the other points that, that will come up in our discussions is that well, virtue is something that's really in a condition of your will, and so someone can't really force you to be virtuous. The no. government can't force people to be virtuous. Yeah. No, I, I certainly I, I believe that to be true, and yet that's what progressives seem to do. And, you know, Dr. Arthur Brooks in his, um, I would say, uh, startling book, uh, Who Cares More, Progressives or Liberals? And he saw that, com uh, that conservatives gave more not only of their money to charitable causes but also of their time and other efforts so and you can't have that unless there's a profit and able to share in those profits but i also call progressivism lazy and i think it speaks to your point right here in that they want something for nothing on their own part they they want to feel good about accomplishing something but that accomplishment usually comes because they have they've persuaded somebody in government to do something I'll tell you, a, a great case of that was up in Laconia, where the local Dunkin' Donut shop had, you know, built a brand new building on part of their uh, land, and they let this old Victorian-type house go into disrepair. Well, some busybodies and, you know, uh, people who believe their nose extended through yours decided, that, well, that was a travesty to let this, quote-unquote, historical building go into disrepair, that they need to save it. And they were kvetching in the paper all the time. Well, the owners ought to be keeping it up. Somebody's got to take care of this. Somebody's got to do this. Somebody else has got to do that. And finally, you know, a number of people wrote in, if you think so much of this building, 
pull the money out of your own pocket and take care of it and buy it and move it and all that stuff. No, 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 no. This is for all of us. Do you cover any kind of an aspect like that in this class where, as you said, when every, when everything's owned by everybody, it doesn't work. It's the travesty, the tragedy of the commons. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's that's one of the core findings in, in economics. And, and how do you deal with the tragedy of the commons? Well, one uh, one solution is is to privatize. If you can, you can privatize. The other solution is to decentralize. Um, so let the if for some reason you can't break the thing up into lots of private property, you let the people who are um, intimately involved with that resource every day decide for themselves how to organize it. Uh, so in Maine, lobster fishermen have dealt with the tragedy of the commons in the lobster fishery by developing a kind of, it's almost an informal system of property rights. The way it works is that there are particular spots in the ocean where each fisherman um, kind of has a, has a property right. And you're not allowed to, to fish there if you're not, if you don't have um, that kind of informal property right. These aren't legal property rights. This is just a custom that's developed. And they've, they've managed to figure this out. What would be worse is for the federal government or someone to come in and say, okay, we're, forget this informal arrangement that you've developed over generations. We're going to sweep that aside. We're going to impose a new regulatory scheme like catch limits or something. And, and uh, didn't, that, didn't that actually happen, uh, Jason, that the federal government tried to get involved in the uh, quota limits in, in Maine? That, that may be. Um, uh, I, I did hear something about that. Um, but uh, what I'm thinking about here is the work of um, the, the Nobel Prize winning uh, political scientist Eleanor Ostrom, who um, researched how to govern the commons. And so she found in cases where you couldn't have pure privatization, decentralization, having local people decide things is, is best. And we've kind of gone the opposite route in this country where the federal government has taken on more and more responsibilities at the expense of states and localities. Dr. Sorens, i got to cut in on you here. We're, gonna run, we're running out of time. Um, <coughs> how do people contact you and get more information about E3NE? Yeah, so our website is e3ne.org. And again, E3NE is short for Ethics and Economics Education of New England. Uh, so if you're a high school student, parent, if you work at a high school, We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'll be expanding this program significantly in coming years. Um, and they, all our contact information is there on the website. So we'd love to hear from you. All right, great. Thank you so much for spending time with Grok Talk. Thank you. All right, that's the end of this segment. Kevin Kervick's in the studio. We will be right back with him in just a few minutes. Stay tuned. Senator Jean Shaheen said, if you like your current health plan, you can keep it. That's not true, Senator. 22,000 New Hampshire citizens have been kicked off their insurance plans. Hospitals in Rochester, Concord, and Portsmouth, they aren't allowed to provide care under the exchange. Senator, you were wrong in your comments. You should apologize for your misleading remarks. I'm calling Senator Shaheen at 750-3004 and telling her I want my doctor back. You should, too. Paid for by SaberPack.org. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate committee. We are struggling. Rising health care costs are part of the problem. Senator Jean Shaheen helped create this mess we're in. As a state senator, her bill chased 21 insurers out of our state. It reduced our choices, raised prices for New Hampshire families, and when Jean Shaheen supported Obamacare, it limited access to 10 of our 26 hospitals, reducing our choices again. Tell Jean Shaheen she's made health care worse. Few things are as important as finding the right doctor. And under Obamacare, that's harder than ever. Over a third of our hospitals no longer available. Our doctors no longer covered. Fewer choices, longer drives. No state has been harder hit than us. And even after watching it impact New Hampshire, Congresswoman Ann Custer still supports it. Call Ann Custer. Tell her Obamacare isn't working for New Hampshire. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, 
the right to know law. And now, at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out? CNHT.org. 